This is the fourth and last part in the presentation series on Essentials of the 2015 Revision of ISO 9001. I'm Terry McCann. In this presentation, we will look at clauses 9 and 10, covering performance evaluation and improvement. Clause 9 of the standard, Performance Evaluation. 9.1, Monitoring, Measurement, Analysis and Evaluation. This subclause has three segments. The first states that monitoring and measurement needs to be done for the purpose of evaluating the performance and effectiveness of the QMS, and that it is up to the organization to determine what to measure, how and when. The second segment states that regardless, customer satisfaction and perceptions must be one of the things that is monitored but the organization can choose how to do this. The third segment requires the organization to analyze the data and information obtained by monitoring and measuring, and then evaluate all of the following as a requirement. Conformity of products and services. The degree of customer satisfaction. The performance and effectiveness of the quality management system the effectiveness of planning, the effectiveness of risk-based thinking, performance of external suppliers, and the need for improvements to the quality management system. There is thus no discretion as to what must be evaluated, although there is discretion as to what data to gather, when to gather it, and when to analyze it. 9.2 Internal Audit. This subclause on the internal audit has two parts. 921 provides the purpose of the internal audit, which is firstly to ensure that the QMS conforms to the organization's own requirements and all the requirements of ISO 9001. And then secondly, to see whether the organization is effectively executing the QMS processes and requirements. 922 then lays out what the organization must do to achieve this purpose. Plan a program of audits with defined scope for each audit. Assign impartial auditors. Make audit reports available to relevant managers. Undertake corrections and corrective actions without undue delay. And keep documented records as evidence of the effectiveness of the audit program. There are thus three essential elements for an internal audit to assess. One, have processes which are important to the organization been identified and documented in the QMS? Two, are there records as evidence that processes are being followed? Three, how effective are the processes, including the effectiveness of the internal audit program itself? The first two are relatively easy to determine. The third is much more of a challenge for the auditor, but more so the auditee. 9.3 Management Review This clause has been relocated from its position in the 2008 revision under Management Responsibilities to fit here under Performance Evaluation, which provides a significant shift in emphasis that is worth noting. Although there is no requirement for management review to take the form of a formal meeting, most organizations use records of meetings, whether minutes or discussion records, to provide evidence of meeting the requirements of 9.3. Also, a schedule of meetings is probably the most straightforward way to demonstrate that management reviews are at planned intervals. Management reviews are the responsibility of top management and therefore members of top management should be required attendees. But there is nothing to prevent other employees from being invited and there is a lot to recommend this practice. There is no stipulation as to frequency other than the requirement for planned intervals, which is at the organization's discretion. Many organizations make their reviews quarterly, some monthly, 
I know one smaller organization that uses weekly all-hands meetings to include management review, spreading the review agenda items over several meetings. I have heard of organizations that have one annual review, but I seriously doubt the ability of management of such organizations to respond in good time to issues that could go back, say, 10 or 11 months. Following a general introduction, the 9.3 subclause has two parts, one describing required inputs or agenda items, the other required outputs, which should be documented as a record. Inputs for the agenda include follow-up action items, changes such as new customers legislation, revision of ISO 9001, performance and effectiveness of the QMS, resources, risks and opportunities, including opportunities for improvement. Documented output includes decisions and action items covering opportunities for improvement, changes to the QMS, and resource needs. Clause 10, Improvement. 10.1, General. This clause on improvement begins with a statement about improvement in general and describes the kinds of improvement that should be acted upon at a minimum. Firstly, actions necessary to meet customer requirements, which seems a bit obvious, one would think, but then also actions necessary to enhance customer satisfaction. It is thus a requirement of the standard not only to meet and deliver customer requirements, but also to enhance customer satisfaction where opportunities to do so can be determined. I have seen debates and conversations around the question of whether corrections can be truly considered improvements. Clause 10 of the standard clearly sees improvement as covering corrections and corrective actions, as well as seizing opportunities to make something that is good even better. 10.2 Nonconformity and Corrective Action structures the activities required of an organization when a nonconformity occurs, whether this is in design and development, production, or post delivery. Firstly, control it, correct it, and address the consequences, and then evaluate the need for corrective action by determining the causes and whether the nonconformity could exist or occur elsewhere. Note then that the standard does not require corrective action in every instance of a nonconformity, but it does require doing the due diligence to make a responsible determination as to whether corrective action is appropriate. If corrective action is called for, it must be reviewed for effectiveness after implementation. Bear in mind that this may require some time to elapse after implementation with periodic active monitoring. I personally know of instances where nonconformities only surfaced a number of years after product installation. Also do not confuse such review for effectiveness with verification or validation both of which should be done before implementation. The fact that this unforeseen event occurred requiring corrective action indicates the need to revisit the risk-based thinking done during planning and, if appropriate, update relevant documentation around risks and opportunities such as mitigations and controls. Changes to QMS processes might also need to be considered. Finally, and of course, there needs to be documentation and records to cover all of the above, but specifically the nature of the nonconformity and the results of corrective action. I do like the requirement in this clause to make the amount of effort proportional to the effects of the nonconformity. This cuts both ways and means that minor nonconformities should not consume much time and energy that would be better spent elsewhere. 
10.3 continual improvement. The standard requires an organization to keep improving its QMS for suitability, adequacy and effectiveness. Top management has a very specific responsibility here with management reviews. They do not necessarily have to do stuff personally, but it is their responsibility to lead the way and to make sure that needs and opportunities are identified and continual improvement takes place. This concludes the presentation series on Essentials of the 2015 revision of ISO 9001. I'm Terry McCann. If you found this series helpful, please click like and share with others. Browse my other training videos, such as the introduction to Lean. If you have questions, please leave a comment or email me at the address at the bottom of your screen. I would love to hear from you.